0 to 160 miles per hour in 2 seconds. That's the force of a steam catapult, launching a 45,000 pound strike fighter from the flight deck of a USS aircraft carrier. For the crew, this is just a day at the office on the most dangerous four and a half acres on Earth. But how do you orchestrate this ballet of fire, steel and immense risk without it all ending in catastrophe? To answer that question, you have to pull back from the fire and the fury of the launch and see the stage and the forces behind the scene. Everything happens on and below, a flight deck four times bigger than a football field. This is one of the United States aircraft careers, a moving piece of American territory. It's a 100,000 ton projection of power operating in one of the most isolated settings on the planet. But 100,000 tons barely tells the story. This is a vertical city. The command tower, known as the island, rises 20 stories above the waves. Below the flight deck, a cavernous hangar bay holds an air wing of more than 75 aircraft. And below that, a labyrinth of passageways connects workshops, medical bays, and living quarters for a crew of more than 5,000 people. All of it powered by two nuclear reactors, giving this fortress unlimited range and the ability to operate for more than 20 years without refueling. It is, for all intents and purposes, a self-contained world. But a world of that complexity, with 5,000 people operating within inches of extreme danger, creates a fundamental problem. How do you get everyone to function as a single flawless organism? How do you impose order on chaos? The answer begins not with a computer system, but with a language everyone can see instantly. The language of color. It's a system of color-coded jerseys known as the Rainbow Crew and every color signifies a critical, distinct role. The yellow shirts are the aircraft directors, the choreographers of every movement on deck. The green shirts are connected to the launch and recovery systems, the catapults and arresting gear. The blue shirts are the aircraft handlers, the muscle that physically moves and secures these massive machines. Then you have the red shirts, who handle all ordnance, the bombs and missiles, and finally, the purple shirts, known as grapes, the specialists who manage every drop of jet fuel. So the greens have the catapult armed, the blues have the jet perfectly positioned, the reds confirm the ordnance is secure. Every part of that complex, color-coded system has done its job to perfection. But in these final moments, everything stops. The pilot, the deck crew, the multi-million dollar aircraft, they all wait. They are waiting for one signal from one person. They call him the shooter. He's the catapult officer. And once he confirms that every single safety check is complete and the carrier is perfectly aligned into the wind, he gives the final decisive signal, the one that unleashes the catapult. That signal is the point of no return. In the cockpit, the pilot's hand moves from a salute to the controls. The engine spools to full afterburner, generating a controlled explosion of incredible heat and thrust. So what prevents that blast from incinerating everything and everyone standing behind it? This piece of brutalist engineering, the Jet Blast Deflector, or JBD. As the jet powers up, this massive, actively cooled panel rises from the flight deck itself. It is a solid wall of steel, built to withstand temperatures of over 2,000 degrees and forces strong enough to throw vehicles off the deck. Getting a fighter jet off the carrier is a science of brute force, but landing it on that same moving, pitching runway, that is an art. In those final terrifying seconds of approach, the pilot places their absolute trust in one person on the deck, the landing signal officer, or LSO. The LSO is always an experienced naval aviator. They've been in that cockpit themselves hundreds of times. Standing on a small platform on the edge of the deck, they are the pilot's external eyes and ears. He provides constant critical radio instructions, making split-second calls on speed, altitude and angle of attack 
to guide the jet safely onto a wire. Now imagine doing it in the dead of night, in a storm, with zero visibility where the pilot can't see the ship and the LSO can barely see the plane. In naval aviation, they have a name for this. They call it a Case 3 recovery. So you have hundreds of crew on the deck and dozens of aircraft in motion. All of these are individual moments of intense focus and risk. The question is, who sees the entire picture? Who is the conductor for this high-stakes orchestra? The answer is found high above the flight deck, inside the carrier's island, in a glass control tower called Pre-Fly, or Primary Flight Control. The flight deck is only half the picture because it can only hold so many aircraft. To see where the rest of the cargo and personnel are, we have to go below the deck, the hangar bay. Another distinctive feature of the Gerald Ford is its 11 advanced weapons elevators capable of lifting heavier loads up to 24,000 pounds compared to those on other carriers. The movement of weapons from storage and assembly to the aircraft on the flight deck has been streamlined and accelerated. Ordnance will be lifted to the centralized rearming location via higher capacity weapons elevators that use linear motors. The elevators are located so that ordnance need not cross any areas of aircraft movement, thereby reducing traffic problems in the hangars and on the flight deck. That elevator delivering a fresh aircraft to the deck isn't just a part of the process, it's a critical link in a chain designed for one thing, generating continuous air power because on a modern USS career, operations don't happen one at a time, they happen all at once. This is all made possible by one of the most important innovations in naval history, the angled flight deck. It's a simple, ingenious design that creates two runways on a battleship. While aircraft are being launched from the catapults at the bow, others can be simultaneously landing on the angled runway at the stern without ever getting in each other's way. It is a continuous, overlapping cycle of takeoffs and landings. At peak operational tempo, a carrier can generate over 120 flights or sorties a day. That's a new flight launching or landing on average every few minutes around the clock. The crew is trained to deal with those massive visible threats, the roaring jets, the spinning rotors, the heat, but one of the most dangerous enemies on the flight deck is something you can barely see. It's called FOD, Foreign Object Debris, and it can be as small as a loose screw, a stray piece of wire, or a pebble from a boot. But that tiny piece of trash, if sucked into a modern jet engine, can cause a multi-million dollar catastrophic failure in an instant. It is a constant, hidden threat, and the only defense against it is discipline. That's why, before flight operations can begin, the crew performs a meticulous ritual, the FOD walkdown. In a long, unbroken line, they walk shoulder to shoulder down the entire length of the flight deck, eyes scanning the ground. And in the end, that slow, careful walk may be the most important journey taken on this deck. It's not a launch or a recovery or a high-speed maneuver. It is the quiet, human foundation for everything else. It proves that this place is more than just a 100,000-ton fortress of steel and nuclear power. It is a living system, built on a foundation of discipline, technology, and unimaginable courage. It is a place of controlled chaos, where thousands of individuals become one organism, all dedicated to a single purpose. 
an environment where failure is not an option. But the story of the carrier is constantly evolving. The technology and tactics you've seen here are already giving way to a new generation of innovation. In the next part of our series, we'll answer the questions that define the future. What happens when steam catapults are replaced by powerful electromagnets? How does the arrival of the F-35C stealth fighter change the game? And what does the flight deck look like when the most advanced aircraft on it have no pilot at all? Subscribe and hit the notification bell to make sure you don't miss part two.